Well, thank you all for joining us for our North Houston Space Society meeting. Uh, this is our July meeting. Uh, we have these every month. Uh, I'm Nathan Price. I work for a software company. I have a Bachelor of Science from the University of Houston in mathematics with a minor in economics. I'm an Eagle Scout, president of the North Houston Space Society, and I do volunteer work at Space Center Houston. Also, I'm doing a project where I'm interviewing a person a day about our return to the moon in 2024, and I'll be doing that until the end of 2024. I was a little hesitant to commit until uh, we actually get back to the moon, just in case it goes over that date, but uh, uh, doing it until so then. So we have a full program uh, set up for you today. I have a few little opening remarks I like to make, then I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Stanley, who's gonna go over recent space news. Lots of things are happening. I'm sure all of you are, are looking at the, um, uh, Virgin Galactic flight tomorrow with Richard Branson, and then on the 20th, Jeff Bezos is going to space, not to mention uh, a gazillion things happening in Boca Chica. And then we have our featured speaker, uh, Dr. Kumar Krishan, uh, who's going to talk about the technology needs and innovations for space exploration. We'll have some time after that for question and answering. And um, also want to save a little time at the end to share personal space experiences since our last meeting. Maybe you've watched the rocket launch, Maybe you attend some other space or science or um, a meeting that makes sense to talk about. Or maybe you visit the uh, restored Apollo 11 Mission Control Center over at Space Center Houston, which they just started uh, having tours at again uh, yesterday, uh, which I actually got to go on one of the training tours on uh, Thursday. So I, I'd like to share with you some of the, the pictures and things I learned from that. And we're going to wrap everything up at 4 o'clock. So on to the opening remarks. So I want to talk a little bit about choices. Uh, you know, we can choose one thing over another. Um, and there's a whole variety of choices. From a personal level, we have a whole range of personal choices that we make on a, a daily basis that affect um, maybe just the moment or longer period of time, such as, you know, what will you eat? Or what will you keep? Or what will you do today? Uh, where will you live? Uh, what will you throw away? And what will be your profession? So we all con uh, understand the concept of, of making choices at a personal level. And then the extension of that to actually making choices at a community level, as a group of people. Uh, you know, there's things that we need to decide together, such as, you know, where do we put the park? Um, how do we keep our communities safe? Uh, where should we build the school? Uh, what's the speed limit uh, you know, that there should be on the road? Uh, what's the library hours? And you know, where to put the sidewalks? Um, so these are all kind of small, uh, you know, kind of tactical choices that, that we have to make on an ongoing basis. But you can even kind of scale that up a little bit because, um, and you know, there's different ways that we actually make uh, these choices. You know, I mean, we, we, some of the choices we make out of habit, some out of belief, some out of doing research and analyzing our options and getting feedback from other people. Some are based upon the, the groups that we, we associate with, uh, peer groups, pressure groups. Um, and some might be just random choices and then some just based upon a feeling. Now, all of these choice making um, kind of um, processes are maybe valid for a certain set of choices, but it, it's good to be conscious about uh, kind of how you're making those choices. And kind of going from sort of like this, this personal level and scaling it up a bit, you know, humanity as a whole sort of has a choice to make. And we may not consciously be making this choice, or we may not be thinking that our views on this choice really matter. But basically, um, the choice that we make drives lots of things. It drives you know, what we do, what we're gonna invest in, what we're gonna learn, what we get excited about, what we tell our friends and family about, what uh, kind of policies we wanna put in place, what we allow and things like that. And this particular choice that I'm talking about really boils down to this. What is the long range future of humanity? We have always known the earth. The earth is a very special place. Um, we thought it was special at one time because it was like everything. And then we learned that, uh, you know, we thought it was special because everything revolved around the earth. And then we learned that that's actually not the case, that 
uh, the Earth revolves around the sun. Then we felt it was special because we didn't know of any other planets. And then we started discovering planets around pretty much every star. Uh, and we looked at the planets in the rest of the solar system and none of them are even close to what the earth offers us. So the earth is an amazing place to be. We need to protect it. We need to uh, be good stewards of it. But um, there was a person that said, you know, earth, the earth may be the cradle of humanity, but you can't live in the cradle forever. And so, you know, what is our other choice? Well, the, the other choice besides only the earth is the earth plus orbital facilities, plus, you know, moon bases, plus cities on Mars, plus uh, facilities on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and, um, you know, free floating habitats throughout the solar system, big vessels going to other star systems. And essentially our choice is only the earth are everywhere. And um, I hope that uh, you all could uh, at least uh, affirm and agree that humanity should really branch out into the rest of the solar system and the rest of the galaxy. And, you know, if we change our thoughts, then we'll change our world. Uh, because, uh, you know, some people may not want to go in that career in space because they're not really sure it's a, a real thing or a long term thing. Um, some people may not want to study, uh, you know, extracting resources from the moon uh, because, you know, it's not really valued. But if, if we do value those things, then you'll, you'll drive that action and kind of feeds back on itself. And so that's the, the real thing about the National Space Society. You know, the vision of the National Space Society, of which we're a chapter, is people living and working in thriving communities beyond the Earth and using the vast resources of space for the dramatic betterment of humanity everywhere on earth and beyond. Um, so how does all those grand things, how does a, a meeting of, you know, uh, 20 people uh, affect those, those, those grand things and how, what, what can we do to actually help that? And, you know, I think a key thing that we provide is actually ed um, educating citizens in North Houston about what's going on in space. You, have, you know, we talked about the space age in the 60s and 70s. I've heard some people talk about this time as being sort of ushering in a quote unquote true space age where we're actually start to take those first steps into space. Uh, we encourage students to explore their space dreams and try to get a little bit more confidence that, you know, don't go with that true and tried career. Go with this thing that's really follow your passion and it can work out. You know, help parents and teachers see the the future in space as well, to also be supportive of that. Open the eyes of investors to potential space businesses and also connect space exploration enthusiasts for fun and community and, and just uh, getting excited about these types of things. And just focusing a little bit more on we educate, there are lots of jobs in space. I was just looking at this morning at Blue Origins website, 376 job postings there. Uh, SpaceX had hundreds of job postings as well, and even lesser known smaller companies like Intuitive Machine had a handful of job postings, and there's, there's literally hundreds of these uh, space companies uh, that are looking for people, so uh, definitely there's, there's that. And we inspire, I mean we got um, uh, rovers on, on the moon, we have uh, you know orbiters around Jupiter, and we had a probe go by Pluto, and we have a helicopter on, on Mars. Uh, not all these things happening right this instant, but these have happened over uh, the past few years. Uh, that's uh, really exciting. So I definitely encourage you to join us, uh, northhoustonspace.org. You could see information about our meetings, sign up for an email list so you could find out about these. You can just join the National Space Society and you know, you'll get a, the Ad Astra magazine, which is uh, filled with lots of information. Um, connect with others that share this vision and educate and inspire communities about the benefits of space to humanity. Just a couple of housekeeping things. I did wanna let you know we are recording this meeting and we're gonna put on YouTube and have it on NorthHoustonSpace.org, <coughs> Facebook and other places. Um, so if you uh, miss part of the meeting or you know, wanna share it with somebody, uh, you can definitely, definitely do that. Um, how to use Zoom, uh, you can, uh, turn on off the video on the bottom left side uh, by just clicking on that start and stop video. Uh, similarly, the mute and unmute for audio. Uh, there's a place to do chatting. And at the end, when we have it open for questions and answers, 
go down to the bottom where it says reactions and click the raise hand button. And what this will do is put the little raise hand icon by your, your, your name in the attendees and actually hold your place in line and we can actually um, you know, call on you in order uh, so that we're not talking on each other. Uh, so I'll remind you about that when we get to the Q&A. Uh, if you wanna get in touch with me, you can email me at nathan.price at northhoustonspace.org. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Stanley. Uh, he's mostly retired, but he's a very busy uh, guy. He creates and develops and manages and innovates uh, innovative technologies, especially on artificial intelligence. Uh, Greg has a PhD in chemical engineering from Northwestern University and a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Purdue University. He has published over 25 peer-reviewed technical papers. He worked at and on projects for a variety of companies, including Exxon, Gensem, AT&T, Intelsat, Biosphere 2, a Japanese nuclear industry and government uh, consortium, uh, integration objects, BMC, and he's also the North Houston Space Society vice president. And as part of that, uh, he's been preparing uh, monthly updates on what's going on uh, with uh, space. And uh, uh, Dr. Stanley, let me turn it over to you. Hey, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, everybody see the introductory slide here? Okay, good. It looks good so, to me. So uh, we'll be talking, we'll be covering uh, different topics, not so much Mars this month, but uh, Venus and uh, more deep space things and uh, in general, the role of uh, disruptive technologies. So um, first we'll talk about the robotic missions to Venus. They've been announced uh, by NASA and others. Uh, NASA in particular announced two of them, which are gonna launch around 2029. And those are the first missions that have been sent by the US in over 30 years, except for flyby missions, where we got a gravity assist really to go to somewhere uh, further, further out actually in the solar system. Uh, the two uh, projects are called Da Vinci Plus and Veritas. They made up in incredibly convoluted uh, acronyms for them, which don't really matter. They obviously were just acronyms. Um, but there are two different purposes. One of them is focusing on the atmosphere, that's Da Vinci. Um, the other one is focusing on topographic maps, uh, that's Veritas. Uh, da Vinci is going to orbit, but then it will also parachute a probe, um, which is a three foot titanium sphere. Um, it'll parachute that down to the surface. It'll take about an hour to get there. That probe will only last about an hour and a half before the uh, conditions of Venus overcome it. Um, the problem, as I indicated on the slide to the right here, uh, the atmosphere is about 90 times thicker than Earth's, which means the pressure is about 90 times higher than Earth's, uh, 900 degrees at the surface, and a lot of sulfuric acid. So it's not really a friendly place. You're not going there for weekends for a long time. Um, but what they're hoping to determine is more information about how the atmosphere evolved. Um, try to figure it out if it ever had an ocean. Um, they're going to be looking for the evidence of phosphine, which had been considered a, a biomarker, meaning there might be uh, there might be life there. That turned out to be kind of controversial. It was a theory for a while. It's pretty much been discredited, but there's enough of a question that they, they made a point to, in fact, add some extra capabilities to make sure to look for phosphine. Uh, Veritas is updating the topographic maps. They're looking for geological activity, like volcanoes and land movement. Now, scientists currently don't really think that there's a uh, plate tectonics going on in Venus, at least now. Um, but yet they do think there is some land movement in, in some form, in some big chunks. And so they're going to be comparing previous data to the new data to try to see how much the land really moves around, if at all. Um, now, other probes have been announced, uh, the European Space Agency, ESA. They have a similar mission, which they want to send in 2031, um, which will just be an orbiter, not a, not a probe that descends to the surface, um, but the same kind of goals, basically. Uh, now, what's interesting is that Rocket Lab, which is a, a small company originally out of New Zealand, now a US company, uh, they're talking about doing a private mission um, using their photon spacecraft, and that would be in 2023. There, there's a picture of that to the right here. Um, they, they only recently started using this, uh, the, what they call their line, uh, photon craft. They, for low earth orbit projects, the, the configuration is quite different, but this is what they call their interplanetary um, configuration. 
um, which may sound rather ambitious for a small private company, but they're planning on doing it. They'll orbit and they'll drop a probe and looking for that phosphine uh, biomarker. Uh, you might think that sounds crazy, but then you put it in perspective. They've already got contracts with NASA um, for taking essentially the same photon spacecraft and orbiting the moon with it. Um, they're gonna be putting that in the same orbit that uh, this future gateway would have, assuming that ever actually happens. And then they've also just recently announced that uh, NASA also has contracted them to go to Mars with this. Now, in this case, they won't be launching with their own rocket. Um, NASA will provide that one way or another, but they are going to send their spacecraft, this particular one, uh, to orbit Mars and use it for analyzing the atmosphere and so on. Um, why now, after 30 years? A couple of reasons, really. One has been all the recent emphasis on climate change. Um, there's always been a lot of uh, interest in Venus because of that, and they're saying, well, it's a, you know, it's a pretty much like an Earth-like planet. It's closer to the sun, but it's just a heck of a lot hotter. Um, you know, so people wonder, well, what went wrong? And so there's that climate change uh, emphasis. And the other thing is the recent excitement over the possibility of there being life there, not on the surface where it's too miserable, but um, up in the clouds. So anyway, both of those things contributed. And now we have multiple missions headed to Venus. Um, closer to Earth, of course, most people have you know, heard about the, the battle of the billionaires with uh, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, both planning on you know, launches very, very soon tomorrow uh, in the case of Virgin Galactic. Richard Branson is still expected to go up along with three other employees of uh, Virgin Galactic. This will be their first launch with passengers. And then they always had two pilots. So they've had piloted missions before. Um, they haven't done that much testing. Uh, and unfortunately, back in 2014, in fact, they lost a pilot. The craft broke up due to a pilot error. So um, but anyway, he's going up. You know, this is kind of like the old, you know, you always, I've always heard these stories about World War II submarines. And when the U.S. launched a new submarine, they always said the welders had to go down in the initial test. And that was to encourage them to uh, make sure they did a good job. And that's essentially what both Richard Branson and... Uh, Jeff Bezos are doing in, the, in these launches. They're showing that it's safe enough that even they're willing to go. Uh, the Virgin Galactic case, it's about a two hour ride. Now, most of that is actually in a carrier aircraft. Uh, their system is you go up in a regular plane, it drops off the rocket, the rocket then shoots up. You end up with about four, maybe five minutes of weightlessness um, on that rocket trajectory. It's a rocket plane shown to the right here, which then lands back in the New Mexico spaceport. Uh, Blue Origin takes a very different approach, a more conventional one, actually. Um, this is uh, with their rocket called New Shepard, which is shown down here in the right. And this is really their first launch with people. They've done maybe 15 launches before, but they've never done with one with people before. And here the first time, they're going to be taking up Jeff Bezos himself, along with his brother. Um, you probably saw it in the news, but there's an 82-year-old woman named Wally Funk, who trained as an astronaut years and years ago, but then was never actually allowed to go to space because they weren't really sending women to space back in those old days. Um, and then the fourth person is someone who in a charity auction decided to pay $28 million. Um, that charity, by the way, is to uh, further STEM education. It's something, it's a side, you know, a side uh, project of Blue Origin. Um, we still don't know who that person is, but somebody thought it was worth 28 million. For 28 million, they could practically go to the space station. Um, so they definitely overpaid for this. They, I guess they wanted to uh, go on a ride with Jeff Bezos. It's about 10 minute ride altogether. It's completely automated. There's no pilots. Um, and you get about three minutes of weightlessness out of that. Now they're, they're really, those two are the head on competitors. They're doing essentially the same experience. Then there's a couple of other ones that you might consider if you don't have quite the amount of money that it takes. Um, We've covered this before, but there's a balloon uh, called Spaceship Neptune from a company called Space Perspectives. Um, they just tested a, a small a, kind of a scaled back version of it on June 18th. And it will, when they do the full sized uh, version, go up about 19 miles, but it's a gentle six hour flight. You know, you're not, you're not pinned down with uh, you know, 3G forces like you get on the, on the rockets. Um, you have a lot more time, but you're only going up 19 miles, but that's enough to see the curvature of the earth. Uh, you know, you get a very different view, pretty much like the view from space further up. And it does have a bathroom if you're going six hours, they do have that, the others don't. Um, a bathroom with windows, so you get a good view while you're using it. Um, and they will be starting, uh, they did start ticket sales starting in 2024. So if you wanna put down your thousand dollar deposit, you can get that. It's only half the price of the other, so it's kind of a bargain. It's about 125,000. 
Um, you know, the markets for these things in general for the rocket-based ones are tourism, of course, but actually also for astronaut training, um, some short research experiments. Actually, both Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin have carried NASA uh, payloads. They're very short trips, but there have been you know times when they've used that. So there is more to it than just space tourism, but tourism is the main focus. Um, so that was suborbital. You know, remember, th both of those just go up and come right back down. Now there's also, of course, a very active market going on right now for space tourism that is orbital, meaning make at least one orbit, you're going up quite a bit higher. It actually takes a lot more fuel to get up that much higher. Um, there's a company out of Houston called Axiom that has uh, done some of this before. They just signed up three more missions. They signed up with uh, SpaceX to, to do them where they actually take people to the International Space Station. So they now have a total of four of these private missions coming up and each one will carry up four astronauts. And these could be private or well, basically anybody who's willing to pay uh, could go. Um, they could be starting as early as 2022. Um, the visits to the space station would take about eight days. You'd have a total of about eight days of the whole trip. So quite a bit longer than the 10 minutes you're getting out of uh, Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic. Um, now with SpaceX themselves, they've got about 10 missions on the Crew Dragon, which is their, you know, their capsule for care of people. Um, now that includes, of course, the contracts they have to deliver the NASA astronauts, and one also that they have with a company called Space Adventures, which also was, they were the people that first contracted the very first uh, private person into space, which was carried up by a Russian uh, Soyuz craft. Um, people don't know the actual cost right now in general, but it's usually been reported as around 55 million a person. So if you got, if you happen to have that kind of money, you can go to the space station for eight days. Now they're doing more than just taking up people. They are in the process of building their own commercial space station. They start off uh, attached to the existing ISS and then they would gradually detach and expand from there. Now some other projects going on, both of which involve uh, SpaceX and, and other people. The first fully commercial human flight to low earth orbit um, is not one of the ones I mentioned already. Um, it's actually just a separate one sponsored by yet another billionaire named Jared Isaac. Um, and this was done, we reported on this one already. He's, he did it as a, a charity drive, so he got people to bid on this. They're paying for the mission through, through that, essentially. Um, and then, of course, there's the, uh, the Dear Moon project, which is a, a bit more ambitious, where it's going into an orbit around the moon. It goes around once and comes back. Um, and that's being paid for by a Japanese billionaire. And that'll be on Starship, so it's a little different. Um, it's not ready yet. So that would be, it wouldn't be before 2023, but it could conceivably happen in 2024, maybe even 2023. Um, the picture on the right here just shows an example of the, uh, one of these crew dragons from SpaceX that's do actually docked at the space station. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, on a little different topic then, we'll talk about some of the disruptive technologies that are going on. Um, there's a company called Relativity Space and it's been kind of a Wall Street darling. Um, it's gotten lots and lots of private money coming out of venture capitalists, out of Fidelity Investments, and they have their billionaire, Mark Cuban, who's been involved with them from the very beginning. You have to have a billionaire these days, that's just required. Um, they've announced a new rocket called the Terran R. It will be ready in 2024. And what it will be is a fully reusable, uh, which is kind of like what SpaceX would do, but it's uh, all completely 3D printed uh, two-stage rocket. It looks a lot like uh, Starship actually, but it's really more a competitor for the existing Falcon 9 in terms of cargo. It would carry about 22 tons of cargo up to low Earth orbit. Um, now they already had their previous rocket. They haven't gone to space yet, but they expect to by year end. Um, and it's also 3D printed, although they haven't succeeded completely in doing that yet. Um, but unlike, uh, the Terran R. This one is expendable. This is a rocket you just throw away. It's, it's not reusable like most of the, uh, well, like all of these SpaceX ones are. And this one would only carry about 2,700 pounds to low Earth orbit. Now, in terms of competition, that's still about four times heavier duty than um, Rocket Lab's Electron rocket, which would be one of their competitors. They do have contracts. They have about nine contracts now. So this, this is real. It is shaping up, um, assuming they don't have any glitches. They should be launching by the end of the year. Now, taking a step back, uh, 3D printing is their big thing. The, their plan, their goal is to print an entire rocket in 60 days. Well, that includes the engine and the rocket, both. Um, others, actually Rocket Lab, they print their three, their, they print their engines right now through uh, Blue Origin, 
prints parts of it, but it's, it isn't really just one overall process. You know, they, they print maybe 400 parts or something. There's a lot of advantages to this. The biggest one um, is that you just get a lot faster iteration. When you decide to make a design change, you know, you don't have to go back to your supply chain and get everybody to, to make new things and to test them out. You know, you just basically change the coding a little bit and, you know, the next one that pops out will be your, your new rocket with a new design. So it's definitely preferred. And that and that's typically been a role of 3D printing. It's been involved in doing prototypes and that sort of thing. Well, these days, the technology is starting to evolve so quickly that uh, everything is a prototype. So that fits the system pretty well. Now their longer range goal isn't just to print rockets. They also want to print uh, habitats. You know, that could be in space or you know, on, a, on a planet or the moon. Uh, so it's an example of a disruptive technology. And it's one that's been around for a little while, but the key thing is it is actually shaping up to play more and more of a role in, in developing space. So the, just to show you what they look like, the Terran 1 is the one that's going up by the end of this year. The Terran R is quite a bit bigger and the, looking at it, it looks kind of like Starship. Um, the picture on the left would just be the second stage. Okay, so talking more about disruptive technologies, um, SpaceX has been really the biggest driver in this so far. Um, what is a disruptive technology? Well, typically it's something that just drastically changes things and usually it's because of drastically reducing costs. And there's this, look at this graph here. This is showing you the price to launch a kilogram of payload into low earth orbit. And starting back in the 80s, you know, the space shuttle would cost about $85,000. By the, by the end of the space shuttle era, that came down to 26. But then Falcon 1 came along from SpaceX and that got up below $10,000 a kilogram. And you look at it now around 2020, 2021, they're down below $1,000. So thinking about that, that's a 90% reduction just, just within the SpaceX lifetime. And even that was almost a factor of 10 below what, what the original space shuttle cost. So we've gone down by 90%, at least through two iterations uh, so far. Now, you look at this curve at first glance, it, you know, the, it looks nice, but then you realize there's a logarithmic scale that is every horizontal line here you know, represents a factor of 10. So if you were drawing this on a normal linear scale, you would see what looks like a cliff in terms of the prices dropping. This is huge. Um, you know, and people actually, at least NASA's goal is to get the price down, you know, even below that. So this has to have an impact, and, you know, of course it does. Um, now, the focus of SpaceX is interesting. They were, they've always talked about reusability, that's been their mantra, and that's, that's, most other companies haven't really even gotten much of that yet, but really they've already gone well beyond that. Their key thing now, if you listen to everything they say, their key is rapid reuse. So, you know, it's one thing to reuse it, but it takes you six months to refurbish or three months or two months. They want to get it down to hours. And everything they do is with that goal in mind is to get it down. Why? Well, for one thing, cost savings. You know, you don't need so many rockets if you can keep reusing the same ones every day. The goal being to look more and more like airplane service as opposed to special one-off kind of things. Those are the extremes. Um, but as I said before about the technology iterations, when you have more and more launches like that, the technology iterations can come faster and faster. And this, this really applies to not just the, you know, the launch technology, but it applies to everything. You look, for instance, at the space station. You know, we've had a space station up there for you know, many, many years now. But the actual amount of time spent on experiments, um, and then, you know, when you learn something, how long does it take to get a new experiment up there? Well, there, before, there wasn't that much access to the space station. Well, now there's so much more access to the space station because of you know more cheaper trips. Um, we can actually start running experiments, learn something, and then send up a new one a whole lot faster. So basically the pace of everything picks up um, when costs drop like that. And Starship um, actually as an example, they take reusability further, focusing on faster iterations, which is what you see down at Boca Chica. They keep you know doing, you know, they just you know, they do an iteration where they just test a certain aspect of the technology quickly and move on to the next one. You do get it, but the other thing, of course, they're getting will be economies of scale. <clears throat> Same thing well, with, uh, with cargo ships. We started getting the ultra large crude carriers and these very large scale uh, transport vessels and everything, basically prices of everything came down. Um, some other examples of disruptive technology, um, ion engines, you see them now everywhere on, on almost every satellite. And also for interplanetary missions, like that Japanese Hayabusa mission, it went out to an asteroid and back, and they're going back out and doing all that on you know tiny amounts of fuel. It's just extremely efficient to use these engines. 
these kind of things just couldn't have been done you know, a long time ago. Um, you might say the CubeSats were you know, four inch by four inch by four inch satellites that were multiples of that. And then technologies to launch them and disperse them like space tugs. All these things are starting to have a huge impact on the costs and ability to get things into space. Uh, 3D printing, we talked about already. Now, future ones coming along, you know, also add, you know, whole changes to really to the economy. If space solar power becomes a reality or, you know, even a space elevator, all these things start to have a huge impact because any cost reduction just opens up new possibilities. And that's why there's been so much investment recently is people see the analogy of the semiconductor industry. You know, you look back at, you know, integrated circuits, you start off with just a couple transistors on a chip and then Moore's law said every, you know, you double that capability every year and a half or so. And so the people lived up to that, to Moore's law. And, but what happened was you ended up getting so much capability and so much new capability every year that you could have whole new industries build up and whole new application areas, just all based on the resulting cheaper computer power. And so what the investors are seeing is that, well, it looks like we're getting this huge decrease just in the cost to get the space. That should enable a whole lot of new things. <clears throat> it's actually come a lot slower than probably a lot of people might have expected. I think it's just a slower moving industry. But the point is it is picking up the pace, uh, getting more and more like uh, the technology, other parts of the technology industries. So low cost launch is a necessary condition, you know, to make all of this happen. But the reality is we need a lot of other new technologies. Um, I mean, what are the big barriers to space right now besides getting there? Um, well, one is sustainable life support. The further you get from Earth, the more important it is that it be self-sufficient. Um, dust is a huge problem. Um, the, the lunar dust in particular is horrible because it never gets eroded away by wind. So it's very, very sharp edged. Uh, but even the Martian dust is quite a problem. It gums up you know, solar panels and everything else. Um, you need in-situ resource use, that is, find things like water, convert it to breathable air, and rocket fuel. Um, artificial gravity, we still don't really know if we can really live on the moon long term or if we're just going to have a you know, short-term life there because people can't stand below gravity. Um, and of course, radiation protection. That one's relatively easy to solve, but it's still an issue. Uh, there's disruptions that also happen in the business models. Um, I mean, a big one actually is NASA really has done a huge shift and to their credit, I'd say, because they're really buying services now, space is a service in a sense, rather than buying hardware, you know, and buying one or two rockets you throw away every year. Now they're just buying the service to get to the moon, uh, to deliver some package to the moon or Mars. And they're moving more and more that way. That brings in private investment and really starts things moving a lot faster. Um, other things they've done, um, the Artemis Accords, um, where, we were there setting up a system so that at least there's a legal basis for using resources in space. It was pretty questionable before. And so as people sign up for the Artemis Accords, that gives private investors much more confidence that they might be able to get their money back by, you know, by mining on the moon or asteroids or Mars. And then even things like in-orbit services, that's becoming a, a business now. Uh, refueling or moving existing satellites. Uh, we've seen some of that in our, our previous newscasts where uh, <clears throat> old the old geosynchronous giant uh, communication satellites, they run out of fuel, but th th they're still working. So what you can do is you can go up and, you know, attach, a, you know, attach something else to them and keep on using them. And we get into deep space, um, other disruptive technologies are coming along um, and that's nuclear thermal propulsion. This is, you know, probably is coming back into vogue. Um, it's very interesting because there's a long history of that. NASA actually had funded research back in the 60s and then canceled it in the early 70s. They even had prototype engines. So this is not a brand new technology that hadn't been used. And this is really strictly for travel beyond low Earth orbit, you know, going to Mars or even, even in this lunar space they're talking about using it. The key is not using it in um, Earth's atmosphere. You know, for obvious reasons, you're afraid of, you know, there's an explosion or something. You don't want all that nuclear material running around. So the idea is you'd get it up into Earth orbit, you would never fire the engines, at least um, you know, until you got to Earth orbit. There are some advantages to thermal propulsion. The big thing is you get high power and efficiency, and that gives you much, much faster travel. So for instance, you might go from Earth to Mars in three to four months, you know, rather than seven to nine. Um, so basically you get the much more power than you get out of chemical rockets, and but you get the efficiency more comparable to the ion engine. You know, those ion engines are very efficient, but they're very low thrust. So they're, they're, this is, a, you know, yet a third solution that offers you the big power when you need it to get around the solar system. Um, kind of a secondary benefit is that you can then, once you get to where you're going, say you're going to the moon or Mars, 
um, you can just take that same reactor and use it for power generation. So you've got your, your built-in power supply as well. That's especially important as you get further further out of the solar system where the solar intensity hits go, goes you know goes down. So how do these things work? Well, basically, you have a nuclear reactor that heats up a, a fluid like liquid hydrogen, heats it up very, very hot, and it expands rapidly, and it just shoots up the back like a chemical rocket. But you get at least twice the thrust that you get from the chemical rockets. And also, that, that same um, expansion actually cools the reactor, so it kind of works out nicely. Um, but apparently, they've come up with some new approaches. There was always danger of, you know, Proliferation, you don't want terrorists getting a hold of this stuff. Well, at least they're not using weapons grade uh, uranium anymore. Um, there are problems with high temperatures and also chemical risks. You're using hydrogen, that tends to uh, cause all kinds of blood metals. So, anyway, they're, they're, they're working on solving these problems. This particular picture is one that always is, shows up in any of the NASA literature on um, uh, what somebody had hypothesized a nuclear uh, vessel might look like. So this funding goes on. Most people have heard about the NASA funding for this because they, they've, they've been sending some money to uh, Blue Origin. But actually, there's really at least three sources in the government all working on this, US Space Force and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, they're all funding it for various reasons. The military is interested um, as well as others. The money is going to places like General Atomics where they're working on the small scale reactors which isn't that difficult in a way because you have the model of shipboard ones right now. Um, Blue Origin, most people had heard about, but it's also going to Lockheed and then a bunch of smaller companies that most people probably hadn't heard of. So anyway, this, this won't happen uh, for quite a while. They're, they're saying, well, maybe it'll affect Mars missions in 2039. So don't hold your breath for you know, waiting on this, but at least they're getting going on it again. So I think that's, that's a plus. Okay, now we're at the point where we ask people to guess how many launches have there been since the last meeting, which was June 5th? And so this is a chance where you, you, get, a, you get a little poll here and you can, you can take a guess as to how many there have been. Um, and I'll remind you that the, uh, we don't count failed launches. Well, we can count failed launches if they actually got off the launch pad and to go to orbit. So all the suborbital stuff you get out of uh, Blue Origin right now and, and uh, Virgin Galactic, those don't count. Um, whereas this one here, the, the picture you're looking at, um, this is actually the uh, Chinese uh, going to you know, sending three astronauts to their Chinese space station. Um, this is a picture of that rocket taking off. That was a mission. It went to orbit, so they count. Um, and actually, just as a point of interest, when you see that orange smoke like that, the exhaust, what that is is partially partially burned hydrazine, um, extremely toxic. It was it used to be very popular as a propellant. Um, it's fallen into disfavor, but they're still using it there. And lots of other rockets use it as well, but it's, it's definitely, people are moving. First they had moved the kerosene and so on. Now actually they're, they're you know, all the newest generation from like on Starship or, or the, uh, the Blue Origin engines, they're actually moving to uh, methane, like the LNG basically. Okay, so let's see, how are we doing? Um, yeah, it looks like we had about 58% uh, of the people vote and uh, most of them, like uh, six people between nine and 10, and then one person for 14 and one person for less than five, so. Okay, well, it turns out that the uh, 14 or more was right. Now, of course, we actually had five additional days because it went from June 5th to July 10th. So, you know, you'd expect maybe a few more. Um, and, okay, let me get rid of this. So what were they? I'll just you know, mention the highlights about a couple of them. Um, there are a couple of interesting ones that are launched on June 13th and 15th, by North, both by Northrop Grumman, Pegasus XL and the Minotaur One. These are solid fueled rockets, something you don't see too much of anymore. Um, in fact, the Minotaur Ones, um, these were based on 54 year old engines from, the, was basically this is a, what is it, plowshares to, I don't know, whatever it is anyway some kind of military use, swords to plowshares, I guess, where Minuteman missiles were, uh, you know, were carrying nuclear missiles or, or anti-missile technology. Anyway, 54 years ago, that thing was, was built. They just used it. That's the oldest rocket engine ever used to launch anything into space. It still worked. Um, that shows you that technology is really quite reliable. Um, the other one has more refurbished stuff, but basically the Minuteman missile played a big role in all these things. The uh, Pegasus is also kind of interesting because like the Virgin uh, 
galactic and virgin orbit craft this is also launched from an aircraft you know it goes up in an aircraft it gets dropped the rocket takes off from there their do their big thing is they're trying to show rapid response they designed and built and launched this thing within a year um, so they're trying to again in the military uses they're trying to pick up the, the tempo so that we can respond to things much more quickly um let's see uh, one, of course, highlighting I mentioned is we just sent, uh, China sent three astronauts to their space station. In fact, they've done some spacewalks and they've been quite active up there. So that, you know, their project is going on. They have a lot more launches to go for that. Um, let's see, moving on to these. Oh, there was a, uh, you know, the, the Russians sent the, their cargo to the International Space Station. You know, that, that cargo, those cargo missions are still split among the countries, mostly U.S. and Russia. Um, one interesting one of Falcon 9 on June 30th, this is the second of their, what they call the transporter series, where they essentially just send up a whole lot of satellites, you know, where they sell, a, they sell batches to anybody who wants them. Uh, they put up uh, 88 small satellites and they cost about a million dollars for a couple hundred kilograms. It's relatively cheap, or it is cheap, period. Um, Virgin Orbit, this is one you probably haven't heard too much about. That's different than Virgin Galactic, although it's all owned by, you know, Richard Branson, or at least he, he's the major stockholder of these things. Um, this is another one where it's an expendable rocket, but it's launched from a 747 jet. Same, so all of a sudden these are these are back in vogue as well for at least these small launches. They sent seven mostly military CubeSats. Remember, CubeSats are the small you know, satellites based on like four by four by four inches or sh small multiples of that, I mean, maybe up to 16 or so. Um, another interesting worth one. Uh, another interesting one worth mentioning is. Um, the Russians continue launching uh, OneWeb satellites, which is actually a British company, a British and Indian company, um, which is offering satellite services to compete with Starlink from, from SpaceX. They now have up there 254 satellites. They plan to have maybe 648 by the end of next year. Um, but their commercial internet service should start in a few months. It takes, it takes a couple of months for the satellites from the time they get launched to their, with using their own propulsion until they get into their final orbits and they'll be waiting for that. But the point is by the end of the year, we should actually have not only Starlink based internet service, but we should all from the space, but also we'll have OneWeb as a competitor. And that pretty much wraps up the launches. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay. I, I thought well, it was really good overview. Thanks uh, for putting it together. It's amazing. I mean, every month I'm kind of blown away by what's all going on and I thought I kept up with everything. <laughs> I have one comment. Yeah. Uh, we had a, uh, NASA had the annual technical symposium about six years ago and we had a panel of um, persons like uh, that came from Virgin Galactic and SpaceX. And at the time, the only avenue was through NASA. That was kind of a roadblock getting to space. But uh, uh, Dr. Greg, uh, you, um, you presented, you know, just how many new commercial businesses are opening up that roadblock. And I think that's very important, uh, especially in the next couple of years. We're going to see a, a acceler accelerated um, space ventures. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. You know, there's there's still some rear guard actions being fought by the traditional space contractors, which ironically enough includes Blue Origin, because when they when they lost that human landing system, uh, the the moon landing for for humans, when they lost that contract to SpaceX, they've been fighting it in courts, and it was a little scary when I think it was. One of the congressmen from uh, Mississippi, or I guess that because because you have the stimulus base there, they were sort of saying, well, you know, we got to put a stop to this because the government doesn't really own all this stuff anymore, and they should. That was kind of a red flag, but uh, it sounds like things are still going ahead. So that was a bit concerning, though. <clears throat> all right, well, it's probably time to. I'll introduce the uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. Kumar Krishan. His topic is going to be technology needs and innovations uh, for space exploration. And he's just the guy to talk about that because that's what he does. He develops strategies for research and technology um, involving NASA universities and industry. So he's had contacts in all three. He is currently an adjunct professor at University of Houston, 
and he's been associated with others, uh, Kansas State, where he graduated, uh, Virginia Tech, Rice, and some others, um, also honorary professorships in, in some Indian universities. Key thing is at NASA, he's held numerous key positions, including chief technologist for the Johnson Space Center. Um, he started off as a staff scientist at Lockheed. He's offered 170, authored 170 technical papers and gotten all kinds of awards, way too numerous to try to list here. Um, for those interested in how people get into space uh, fields, he has his degrees in electrical engineering, uh, master's and PhD from Kansas State and uh, various degrees before that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Krishan. Let's get it first oriented, make sure that we have the projection proper, projection of slides. It's like one of the employees at NASA retired and uh, he was having fun with his grandchildren. His one grandchild uh, said, Grandpa, what did you do for NASA? And he said, give me a projector. So one thing that has gone into my DNA is having a projector, having the slides. Uh, uh, Dr. Stanley, I want to congratulate you both, uh, you and uh, uh, Nathan Price. You have given outstanding presentations and it's gonna be impossible to go any further, but I will try my best. And the reason is a lot of things that I will say have already been said, therefore I will go a little faster. And it'll be my take on things. My experience, uh, I have been associated with space from 1965 January, always at the outside, not necessarily at the heart of the rockets and what have you, but at uh, the place where it all starts, technology at a very low level, and then graduating it to the point that we can take it to space. So I will talk my view of next few decades of space exploration, which is already happening. I, I was on this uh, beat for many, many years. Uh, so uh, some challenges I still see, a list of uh, technologies because in the last, uh, what, uh, seven, eight years before I retired at the end of 2018, NASA gave me this assignment, go look at everywhere. All the countries over in USA and make a list of technologies that we should be exploring for human exploration or here does human exploration. So then I will talk a few things and some of these uh, Dr. Stanley already mentioned. So now uh, we'll slowly pick uh, pace, uh, but this, when I reached Kansas State University from Calcutta University in 1965, January, there was a magazine, it had a page, with the picture of President Lincoln, to the side there were these words, towering genius disdains a beaten path, written in big type. It seeks, that towering genius seeks the regions here to unexplored. It fit me well. Left home after 10th grade, left the place, Kashmir, where I was born and brought up uh, after uh, I did bachelor's, left Calcutta, came here, kept going. So this is the thing that we have. From childhood, we explore. We are humans. We want to know what's going on outside. And that's the bottom line. To me, the story of the universe is in the embryonic stage. It hasn't even started. 
to give us an idea of time, space, energy, matter, and life. I was uh, talking to uh, Dr. Ting, Nobel laureate at MIT, and he said, you know, with Big Bang, he was explaining time and space were born and so on. I said, Dr. Ting, I thought time was there all the time. And he looked at me, he said, I'm not too sure. <laughs> so you can see where we are. We don't have good stories of how time came about, how space came about. And I can give you rudimentary, which I gave to my colleagues at Rice University, rudimentary explanation that this universe is not alone. Yet when you talk to people who are knowledgeable, they will tell you, come on, you can't go outside. I say, yes, I can mentally, hopefully, if not physically. So energy, matter, and life, there is not a story. So exploration, we have seen so many good things that Dr. Stanley, you know, did an excellent briefing. Uh, we need to explore Earth a lot more than we have, and we are. We have started from the very beginning looking at Earth. Then, of course, you know, moon is our nearest neighbor and we need to learn a lot how to stay on the moon longer and longer periods of time, utilize and do recycling of our resources, utilize the resources. It's a learning field. And long time back, 45 to 50 years ago, my boss told me, Kumar, what is the greatest thing you think about moon? I couldn't think of many things, but one of my colleagues told me, tell him helium-3, <laughs> you know, now I'm learning that helium-3 is not so easy to, to kind of harness uh, on the moon. But one thing I told him, we will get free vacuum. I was concerned here on the earth, whether you go to Lawrence Livermore or you go to University of Houston here, to create pristine vacuum is itself a big problem. And I said, you know, we'll have free excess to looking at space without atmosphere, et cetera. Now Mars is grabbing our attention for obvious reasons and there's no need to really repeat, but the obvious reason is that life could have existed on the Mars, may even exist in some form or shape even right now. Of course now, you know, asteroids and all this belt. When I took coursework in this field, it's ironical, but there's a whole belt of these things and who knows what's out there and who knows how we can utilize that. Of course, uh, you know, uh, black holes are the center of gravity for understanding everything. So now we will be and uh, already L5, you know, uh, Nathan mentioned about L5, but at the time I started this, I was on the learning curve. And when I understood the beauty of these vibration points, you could tell there'll be a lot of activity uh, in the L1 and L2, because you put the assets there, you don't need to propel them all the time. You can assemble things, you can do things. These are going to be uh, a lot of, uh, uh, attraction points or attraction spaces for space exploration. So now, uh, next few decades, as I see, uh, and again, this is my perspective of what I learned from 1965 to this point, is that exploration of solar system and universe will continue like you never believe it. Earth orbit and Lagrangian points for observation of what's out there, what's on the earth, how the earth is changing, critical to our needs, right? Storing, assembly, station. And I am going back to uh, Dr. Stanley's presentation, repeating myself. Human laboratories and recreation and tourism, of course, moon and Mars are, you know, right at the heart of technology development. Communication, communication has been a big thing. When I wrote the first paper, I was luckily in the, communication committee of the agency, we did the advanced uh, communication technology satellite acts that was switchboard in the sky. That was a really at that time disruptive technology, I would call it now in terms of what Dr. Stanley explained. And during that time, 
people were questioning, you know, Kumar, we got, we will be getting now fiber optic. We have pretty good can continuity here on the earth. You know, we'll be using microwave from point to point and this and that, but now see how satellites, uh, and there's going to be a lot more of them, uh, global positioning system and derivatives of this system. Of course, not the, not the least, probably a big thing for the space will be this space force that we were the first nation in the world to establish a space force. And now you'll see the domino effect Every nation will have space force, a lot of activity. Space will be used for many things that you may or we may or may not want to see it used. But that's the reality of, of uh, future. Moon over, uh, uh, we've gone through recycling of resources in situ, uh, more uh, mission test bed. And we were so excited 40 years ago at Johnson Space Center, and they said, we will go to moon and stay there for a while. We were making dreams that every day there would be a little broadcast, video cast from there, and maybe we can fly a couple of actors, a couple of actresses, and we'll have this soap operas being broadcasted from the moon. Mars, again, robotic missions going so strong, and uh, China about, uh, I would say, yesterday or day before announced that they will have a human mission to Mars very soon. And you know, we have to take China very seriously. They do things under the belt, they do things behind the scenes, and then they uh, will construct a space station and a lot of people who are gone hot, to see what they're doing, where their facilities are. So now there was an article written by Alison uh, Matayus. I just came to know about it accidentally because she just uh, called me up from California, Silicon Valley. Well, uh, yeah, Silicon Valley. And she said, I will talk to you about what NASA's reaction is to this. To what? I asked. She said, Big Tech seems ready to conquer space. What she meant by Big tech is not SpaceX and Blue Origin and all these. They are there, you know, Lockheed's and Boeing's and all that. But what she meant was Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, interested in technology, venturing into space communication, making um, space to store uh, information, to, to process information, to then send information to any designated place in the universe, on the moon, on the Mars, or the Earth. So we will see huge. You, you're already seeing 71 to 76 gigahertz at the time I joined NASA. Uh, this would be a dream band, 81 to 86 gigahertz. You can see these, are, uh, the, these, these will have tremendous uh, bandwidth for the signals. 3,235 satellites uh, for the project Cooper. Earth observation will explode because we're seeing Earth changing. I don't know if I have those sl slides, probably not, but Earth is a changing planet. It's not a constant thing. And global positioning satellites, big tech companies have money, they have resources, they can come in. Google, Microsoft, all these companies, space community growing rapidly as I see it. Because of that, no space entities now, enterprises coming into space. So I'm not going to belabor because Dr. Stanley did a great job of exciting us how space will explode. Now, here at the highest level, what are the drivers of the, uh, the technology, the needed uh, uh, new uh, technologies? To me, Performance in extreme environments. Gravity, you, you have nearly zero gravity in, in low Earth orbit. Then you have 18% on the moon. You have 38% on the Mars. You have uh, temperature variations. Uh, you know, books have been written and we studied temperature so long. You know, even within one orbit of the International Space Station, you are looking at plus 300 degrees Fahrenheit to almost minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a big cycle of temperature change. So vacuum creates problems because 
whatever we have inside wants to go outside dust uh, that was already brought up dust storms is one of my favorite things because on the mars <laughs> we will so to say uh, lose our lunch or our lunch will be eaten by these dust storms if we don't pay attention so the mission cost of course mass i learned the hard way you know people learn easy but i am a student and i am a low you know, slow learner, I learned that mass is a critical item. You reduce mass, you reduce the cost of the mission. Size, make things small, make them lightweight. That itself is a big order. Power consumption, long life, reliable. We don't have anybody to change a bulb there. there. You know, we, we need recycling in situ resources. High degree of autonomy, we may talk about this, reliability and safety. Safety is a critical item for human missions especially, and we have paid so much uh, you know, uh, attention here at Johnson Space. So then uh, this is a chart from NASA headquarters. It's a long time ago chart, but I still love it. Uh, size per mass, you know, we want bigger things that will kind of like uh, fit like an umbrella here so uh, we can put them in small package, send them over lightweight and then they will explore, they will allow us inside and we can have habitats, we can have any kind of for mass, I'm going fast but that's okay. Uh, so factors of the order of uh, 100. One thing I learned in NASA, just have the goal which is almost impossible to reach. It's like, you know, okay, we will have 100 times lighter, you know. It's like, uh, and I will make that point during the time I talk about nanotubes. But anyway, that doesn't mean necessarily tomorrow you are going to reach. But even if you come with 10% success, you have made a great impact. Capability for mass and power. We need intelligent systems, independent, ready to roll out from you might have a delay of back and forth of, of about 45 minutes. So we need autonomy big way. Uh, so medical autonomy, uh, and I'm very concerned about the psychological effects of long duration flights. And that itself, uh, I'll talk about one or two technologies that will help there. So of course, you know, uh, where is the water? How do you get the water? You know, it's easy to say, okay, go to the uh, pole of the moon, there is some water. Uh, on the Mars, there's some. Now, when I talk to chemical engineers and Dr. Uh, Stanley will hopefully appreciate this point, they say, more. it is so simple to get that water out of that dust. You keep heating it up to 600 to 800 degrees centigrade and you will get lots of other things. Not only the vapor of the H2O, but all other crud will come in. So eat and that it may be at the end of the day, if we don't have processes and technology that it may be cost effective to take a kilogram of water from the earth. I'm not kidding you, unless we make technology and solutions that will make this kind of thing cost effective. Now, lunar dust grabbed my attention with Harrison Smith's, you know, there was a tear down in his uh, space suit and People say that he got, uh, you know, a little bit um, sick. And uh, some say that that was not the necessarily the case, that it was not due to the uh, lunar dust. But whatever the case is, the dust has grabbed my attention because it can really ruin a mission. First of all, you know, in some cases, it can get your uh, tires stuck and then you are stuck forever. But and then comes radiation. Uh, I was the chairman of the radiation committee here for a little while at Johnson Space Center. We had tremendous scientists. We had Dr. Badwar and others. And we learned the hard way that radiation has so many uh, effects on the human uh, life. You know, now we have understood that basically even at the DNA or an alien, you know, uh, chromosome level, uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, effects. So uh, single event upsets and, and even the structures so on and so forth. And now we have 
there are some solutions. I think Dr. Stanley hinted, but I don't know of very many good solutions, but there are some solutions being explored. I, I might have a hint to that. So space radiation is a big thing. In fact, uh, President Obama mentioned it at Kennedy Space Center. I was surprised. He said one of the tall poles will be how we will take care of the space radiation and make people survive in such uh, impossible environment. There are cardiovascular uh, vascular risks, degenerative tissue risks, all kinds of risks come in. So uh, thriving in space, there was an article in Aerospace America in November of uh, 2020. Uh, they had five CEOs from different top companies. Uh, like one was from communications. And again, Dr. Uh, Stanley covered it very well. And huge infrastructure in terms of communication is needed between, for example, Moon, Mars, Earth, and whatever else we want to capture. You know, if we go to these asteroids and all that, you're looking at a big infrastructure of communication connectivity. And this is Everything is moving. There, it's not a stationary uh, place. These uh, L, uh, L1 and L2, the, the libration, Lagrangian points, you know, everything is moving and connectivity becomes a problem and the rate becomes a problem and so on and so forth. So we'll see a lot of work being radiation hardening this, this uh, thing. Food production, I might have a little bit more on this, but food production, you know, in movies, wow, Martian movie, wow, you know, you can grow anything on the Mars, but do you really grow it? Uh, my two grand project for their science fair, and uh, we're learning the hard way, it acts so simple. Water, nutrients are needed. Large-scale food production is almost very difficult to do. So we need that technology. Food, you know, uh, Dr. Stanley Lau, astronaut here at Johnson Space Center, he has a, had a beautiful presentation on how much food we need, for, for example, for three or four astronauts to go to Mars for 10 months and come back 10 months, stay there 10 months. It was incredible. You almost need a, a complete grocery store to carry. So we need to know how to grow food inside uh, in habitable habitation modules and definitely on the moon and Mars. And manufacturing, this was brought up, 3D printing. How do we manufacture things, uh, resources that we have, the dust on the moon, uh, dust uh, on the Mars. Uh, so bioprinted human tissue, uh, so on. Mining is a big thing. Uh, these are easy to talk about. We know we need, uh, over here on the earth, we get stuck when we start mining. Uh, how many times the machines are not working? And now you have to do this uh, kind of um, uh, without human intervention. You have to do it automated. Uh, so then we need to find out who needs what we want to mine. And uh, water production, for example, mining metals and so on and so forth. So transportation, these are the five items that were listed in Aerospace America as outgoing. In other words, in the next few years, we'll be spending a whole bunch of technological uh, dime and nickel on these things. Reusable vehicles, we, that was brought up, need for propellants, uh, lunar poles, of course, uh, harvest, water, harvest water, so on and so forth. Uh, so now, uh, forming on Mars, not so simple. Uh, I cannot go through this, it will take a lot more time, but uh, Mars dirt high in pH, how do you lower that pH? Not so simple, you have to mix it with so many things and uh, you know, geoponic, hydroponic, all kinds of things. Uh, microbes we don't have on the Mars, microbes eat salts. Salts are uh, Line seeps. We were monitoring with a plane, and I was uh, responsible for that uh, project. You'll be surprised once the cylinder comes on the uh, field. You, you know, if it is uh, a field of corn or or wheat, once the soil becomes saline, you lost it. So now those are some of the issues. 
So it's not quite as easy at it, as it looks in the Martian, but that's a big thing. Here is your uh, a chart from NASA that shows how many connectivities we have to have. We have to have uh, assets uh, communication in the orbit on the surface, in the orbit on the surface, and, and so many places and uh, low earth orbit, uh, geostationary libration points. So it keeps going on and on. So general comment I have is that one of the reasons we need high tech is that we're leaving these things on the moon and Mars. Who is going to clean it? Who is going to clean all the crud we are leaving there? Things that so, so essentially we are creating a bigger problem like we have created on the earth. Land, water, uh, you know, air is all polluted. In some countries, it's very hard to breathe. This uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, showed critically in some of these countries how the pollution went down. So I'm saying, what is your technology to create at least put these planets back where they were. So now, uh, this was the assignment I had in the last uh, uh, seven, eight years of my uh, duty at Johnson Space Center. They said, okay, provide recommendation and plan to mature early state technologies, which will close critical human exploration technology gaps. That was not a small order, but I learned the hard way over the years that you have to have colleagues who are willing to help you. Colleagues at, within NASA who are experts, colleagues in all kinds of different uh, industries like Boeing, Lockheed, wherever you can find them, universities. And that is the flow I had here, interacting with the different people, top-notch people, you know, people at the level of Nobel, Nobel laureates here at Rice with, uh, people like Rick Smalley, Bob Curl uh, at University of Houston, uh, Paul Chu, all these uh, fed information to me. And I was like a collection point, a student learning whatever I could from these experts and then bringing it back in a coherent way with the help of my own colleagues at Johnson Space Center to produce a mosaic. You know, it's like little pieces of puzzle and put it together for making human missions uh, cost-effective, reliable, safe, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the first ones is this quantum vacuum plasma thruster. This is, um, uh, the thing that Sonny White, uh, a PhD from Rice University, he came, uh, he, he has put in a lot of time, but he's not the first one to, to, to talk about it. There are charged particles in space. Now, if you're able to create a um, body of these like charges, like plus charges, then you separate them into two communities and they will repel each other. That creates uh, the uh, thrust. Uh, I'll talk about the second. This is uh, Franklin Chang Diaz's uh, and uh, variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket. I have a couple of slides on that. Habitation water, uh, wastewater recovery technology. Uh, for example, you know, urine, uh, at the time I was the chief technologist. Honestly, all the budget, whatever they gave, four or five million dollars for here and there, uh, we put it in in, uh, sorry, recycling of resources and maximum in water. In other words, urine and all that. It was incredible how pe astronauts were protesting at that time that they would not be able to, uh, you know, drink urine after it is processed. But now it's a routine thing. So we have to do the same with any and every waste that we produce. So uh, bio uh, digesters, waste to fertilizer conversion technology, we're working on it at Johnson Space Center, made some progress. Laser process heat exchangers, this is where the heat uh, that you generate, excessive heat, how can we uh, harness it? How can we harvest it? And how can we reutilize it? In situ, we have talked a lot about these methane, water, uh, and of course, oxygen production. 
Augmented reality is a big thing for me. And let me stop here and spend 30 seconds. The big thing here, once I learned about this augmented reality is you create a scene. You can create a scene where your family is around you in 3D. And uh, we, I have a colleague in Brazil, Dr. Simone Fuchter. She has written a lot of papers and she's doing research in this. In fact, I invited her a couple of times to Johnson Space Center. But the bottom line is, why did I latch onto that? Not only you can easily um, repair things because you can show step by step on 3D, go here, do this, turn this off, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that's a big thing. Not only you can train with this, uh, augmented. But my take was you can keep psychologically in a better state, the astronauts, by making sure that they are able to see in their uh, spacecraft uh, in 3D their family. And of course, training, you know, you can keep sending training modules for th three years. People uh, forget what they learned uh, if they are like, like myself. Expandable uh, structures, we worked here, we have uh, patents on this, uh, this is um, uh, carbon fiber uh, technology habitats, and I believe uh, uh, there are some of these expandable uh, structures up there right now. So shape morphing, uh, the, what happens with this uh, heat, some of these uh, metals uh, change the shape and we have been able to use them for uh, radiating heat out of, for, for example, making antennas, things like that. Effects of dust and dust storms, I think we have done, overdone on that wavelet technology. I have, have a couple of slides on this. Advanced spacesuit technology is a going thing. And now you're seeing how from, you know, Apollo time to this time, how we are progressing, but uh, not necessarily there yet, because if you keep the astronaut for six to eight hours, you got to understand that you need to make allowances for their excretions, et cetera. I think uh, you got my point. So now new sensor technology, sensors are always needed, both in terms of their capability of working in harsh environments like radiation and all that, and also their capability of doing what they want uh, these sensors to do to the accuracy that we want them to do. So temperature, atmosphere, gases, biological uh, monitoring, and of course, human health monitoring. Autonomous systems, there's a lot of emphasis now on deep learning algorithms where, you know, uh, the, the machine itself will uh, learn where its fault is, where its failure is, go back, repair that failure, and so on and so forth. Uh, carbon nanotechnology coatings, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it. And uh, this, uh, uh, IPMC technology, I have a couple more, and superconductor technology, of course, we have. Lucky to have University of uh, Houston here. Uh, terahertz technology is also my favorite. You know, once you go to terahertz, you will have two times uh, that, uh, two times the bit rate. So, but uh, why is it good, in my estimation, is on the moon, nothing will, you know, you can send these terahertz a few, uh, uh, kilometers even. But over here on the Earth, you know, they will get attenuated so quickly. So Moon and Mars, these terahertz will work and, uh, and they will image you like a photograph in the dark and many circumstances, they will provide an image of the, of course, communication and many other things will be. So now I'll quickly go uh, probably talking, you know, it's like carrying coal to Newcastle. Uh, or saying, you know, preaching to the choir, but uh, these uh, uh, are super uh, materials where uh, we found out at University of Houston that we, uh, we can uh, have yttrium barium copper and it will cool with liquid nitrogen. And once we do that, the costs get very uh, competitive compared to uh, cooling with helium. So there's a lot of progress happening. Uh, wires are being manufactured. There are companies who are working flexible YBCO thin wires. So these are coming into the Department of Defense much more than you and I know. And they are doing a, 
a very good job in many circumstances. My one of the, th I want to here again, stop for a couple of minutes. One of the things I had in mind was the antenna, making an antenna. So Dr. Wolf here at uh, uh, University of Houston made a little antenna uh, to show the um, uh, feasibility and antennas eat a lot of I square R loss and other losses and uh, making antennas with this would give you a, a very good signal to noise ratio. The other thing I had, of course, there is this Meissner effect. Uh, you know, who knows what kind of transportation we will need in space, but here on the earth, Japanese made uh, a few kilometers uh, train, uh, levitated train with uh, height. Okay, here's the second, so the, 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 the first one, uh, I was uh, talking about the application of superconductivity uh, in, in terms of uh, making sure that we could uh, put this in a place on the moon like a crater so the temperatures can go down to almost liquid nitrogen and you can have this levitated train effect and you can launch, uh, you know, have launching services. So then you have the squid, the least amount of uh, magnetic energy can be uh, monitored and University of Houston has done some work on detecting early detection of cancer on, on this. So now I'll uh, march ahead because time is uh, limited. So uh, this ionic poly polymer metallic composites, uh, there was a degenist from France who worked on these uh, plastic materials. They, at the end of the day, uh, Dr. Stanley being a super chemi a chem uh, chemical engineer chemist, uh, will uh, agree that they are like Swiss cheese. They have little openings inside. And he was able to impregnate some saline into that and then coat the outside with uh, a cathode and anode, then put a little voltage across and suddenly it became like a finger. Now it started moving, bending because uh, the uh, 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 cations and anions moved. Uh, one place got richer in, in cations and one place lost and therefore the bend. And can you imagine uh, with that bend, you can see uh, with 1.4 volts per millimeter, you can raise a coin, which is a lot more heavier. Now, I, I always uh, was um, uh, on this technology, I have been cooperating and a uh, lot of uh, funding also. Dr. Kwang Kim, uh, he is at the University of uh, Nevada Las Vegas now, and he has written several books on it. Uh, and the thing I wanted to make was uh, Mars fly instead of the helicopter that we have right now going around. My concept was make small, small flies. And even if uh, some, some of them don't work, but bunch of flies together and give a very complicated task, monitoring task or whatever that task is. So that was Mars fly and of course snakes. And even uh, uh, some of these could go underneath uh, the uh, dirt of Mars and uh, uh, moon and get you the data. Of course, for the uh, United States Navy, I was pushing having fish that can be, uh, that can do some things for us. So uh, the other great thing um, uh, about this IPMC material is that once you put it on a table or some platform, if that platform is micro vibrating, it generates the, 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 those cations and anions are so mobile that they go one, from one side to the other and therefore generate a little voltage. So you can sense the uh, vibration. Now, why is that important? I was talking to my boss, Dave Listma. He was an astronaut for several missions on the shuttle. I said, Dave, now you will have a space suit that you will have to try to move your arm. So in doing so, because you will be pushed by these uh, little plates that we will put in the, inside the sleeve 
and they will be made, made with IPMC. So you're resisting that motion. And the other thing uh, I was going to tell you, so, so vibrations can be measured. Uh, oh, uh, I, I think uh, one thing I don't see here the slide for, but what I was going to tell you is that we also learned at Johnson Space Center that if you take a mouse and vibrate the bones, you do not lose the mass even uh, if you rest the, 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 the uh, mouse for quite some time. In other words, bottom line was that uh, if you uh, have 10 minutes per day of 90 hertz of vibrations, uh, you won't lose the mass. Now, this is very good news for astronauts because muscle atrophy and bone loss is a big problem. Of course, their heart also gets affected. So uh, vibrations uh, are caused with many uh, reasons. We know that. And uh, the idea here was this material can do two things. A, it can sense the vibration. B, it can dampen the vibration because this material will do just the opposite of what the vibration is doing. So uh, now I come to a couple more. Uh, I think we are getting done. So uh, as soon as Rick Smiley and Bob Curl got on this um, you know, buckyball, and then uh, I believe it was Japanese scientist who came out with a tube. So I go to Rice University, and Dr. Rick Smiley takes me to the lab, just like a little kid shows me how these tubes are made, but they come in bundle, you know, like you are seeing on your left screen. And we have spent a huge amount of time. At that time, he told me that uh, these things are 100 times stronger and uh, lightweight. Then slowly after a year or two, he told me 10 times stronger, but that's okay. That's what I said. In the beginning, we have sort of, uh, you know, goals and aspirations, but it may not come like that. But there is a, there are scientists at Rice who are working on gold nanoparticles and whatnot. So this is getting a big thing. And these uh, tubes, can you believe? Now we have at MIT, a chip has been made in August of uh, 2020. It's an advanced microprocessor built with carbon nanotubes. We, I, I, we couldn't even dream of this 25, 30 years ago when, when these tubes came about. Of course, they if you impregnate them rightly, you can also have uh, temperature um, you can stand a lot more temperature and also a lot more radiation. So people are experimenting uh, with these. Somebody told me that there is a, a kind of um, a paint available. Uh, you can spray on your window and you can get a lot more strength out of that window. So a uh, couple more things. So one thing is Vasmer. Uh, we have talked about it. You bring helium or hydrogen, you ionize it, you take the heavy ions, uh, you uh, generate energy through magnetic field. And uh, one of the things we uh, were thinking of is use the uh, superconducting magnetic coils. And we have been talking to Dr. Paul Chu's superconductivity uh, institute there. And uh, therefore, then you release and you get a big uh, push. And this would take you to Mars in about three months, according to the calculation of uh, Dr. Franklin Chan Diaz. I was fortunate. I was the in charge of this project for about a year because Dr. Franklin Chan Diaz was so busy with flying shuttle. Uh, Dr. Aaron Cohen told me, you take care of this. So I learned a lot about this and it's going on right now. I believe uh, Franklin is doing, uh, uh, trying to find out how long you can uh, keep uh, 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 this plasma active uh, and how long you can keep uh, discharging it and generating. The last thing I want to talk about is wavelet technology. Again, I was so thrilled with this. Uh, with this. So Debuchis gave it to us, uh, I think it was not too long ago, and she gave us a, a set of two functions. Uh, we already had wavelets, you know, if you look to Schrodinger's equation, Maxwell's equations, uh, some of those equations, complicated equations have a, a wavelet 
solution. But what we didn't have was the orthogonal wavelength. Just like in the case of Fourier, we have the sine and cosine. When you multiply the two and integrate over a period, uh, the integral comes to zero. If you do the same thing here, now the beauty about these uh, wavelets is there are huge, um, how do I say, um, families and colonies of wavelets now we have discovered. And the beauty is that with 27 wavelet, uh, wavelets uh, trying to uh, simulate a triangular pulse. You can see there is nothing before, nothing after, but when you do with 27 term Fourier, you can see it's not a good match. And that, my colleagues, means that information can be processed much more accurately. You will see discontinuities. If you're recognizing the face of a person, you will see discontinuities. Uh, there, there are uh, these uh, FBI, CIA uh, uh, is using these to uh, uh, recognize the thumbprints. And that's the uh, uh, chart here showing this. And so there are a lot of applications in the classified world, but has space used some of these? No, we're in the hole. You take as an example, this, uh, uh, wh what I call um, uh, uh, the uh, superconducting technology from University of Houston. At that time, I went to Dr. Cohen and I said, if we put this magnet, superconducting magnet inside a um, crater on the moons that never has seen sun, and we put 10 watts of water there, uh, sorry, power there, Dr. Cohen, after 10 years, you will get almost 9.99 .99 watts. You, you will not have I square all of. He was excited, he said, how many thousand dollars do you need? And, and a lot, lot of efforts, initial efforts, we tried to fund University of Houston. So now, I, uh, as, a, as you see, uh, Dr. Barris, uh, Richard Baranuk, these, Dr. Barris has a book on, on these uh, wavelets. Uh, a lot of application denoising. You can take out noise very easily. Now, I want to say one, Thing where the wavelets won't be that great. That is when you have periodic signals. For, for videos, photos, they're great. The first thing to convince my uh, NASA colleagues was we took a, uh, for example, shuttle fo photo and we uh, reprocessed it uh, using the uh, cosine square transform, the sine and cosine transform. And then we did the wavelet transform, it was incredible, the accuracy, the crispness of that shuttle photo. But here is a photo uh, of a, a beautiful lady that you can see lossless wavelet transform. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, my presentation was made much more easy. If I committed anything that was not Rightly said, I think Dr. Stanley did a great job and he, uh, I was lucky that he was ahead of me. Therefore, between the two of us, uh, I want to say probably we covered quite a bit of ground. I want to thank uh, Heather. Heather, your last name, Dom Yan, Yon, sorry, Dom Yon. Am I pronouncing it right? Yes, you are. Thank you so much, Dr. Christian. Uh, Dom Yan, and I go back to many, many years. We are uh, trying to help uh, the uh, STEM through uh, science engineering fair of Houston. So I know her and she had has a lot of uh, trust in me and confidence in me. And I appreciate her, uh, you know, bringing my name to you. And I appreciate uh, North Houston Space Society for giving me this honor. It's not so easy for me. You know, I'm a student. I'm not even a, I don't consider myself beyond being a student. Thank you. And I will be glad and honored to answer any questions. Well, thank you again uh, for coming here and presenting. Uh, you brought up the uh, science fair and, you know, maybe that's a good uh, segue. Um, Dr. Dumyan, 
uh, to to kind of introduce uh, our um, one of our guests. Sure. No, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, you know, because uh, being a collaborator, of course, with the North Houston Space Society and being able to share out the, the wealth of information expertise that we have here with our collaborators and attendees, um, I'm able to invite our students who are 6th through 12th grade. So we happen to have one of our students that were here who took us up on the invitation, uh, Ramya Ilangoven. And uh, uh, Ramya, if you could un uh, mute yourself for a moment and, and kind of let us be able to see who you are. Um, but she is a, a, an excellent uh, student who is an HISD at TH Rogers. And she has done a fabulous job in her um, STEM research and has won uh, the very best award for middle schoolers and, and moving up, of course. And um, at this time, Ramya, would you like to kind of give a, a quick debrief of what your research was? I researched on the effects of stress management and relaxation techniques on um, intensive care unit nurses. So what I found was really outstanding. Um, after 20 minutes of just relaxation, I found that the heart rate of the intensive care unit nurses went significantly down, their uh, systolic and diastolic blood, uh, blood pressure went significantly down, and their memory increased. Compared to the nurses in the control group who just did their own relaxation, nothing very significant happened. And um, the reason why this is so significant is because today our frontline workers, they're working so hard and we're so thankful. But if they just make one mistake, then a patient's life is at hand, right? So um, if they can just be relaxed for, um, if they're like, if their relaxation levels can increase, then they can, this is like impacting millions of lives. They're saving more millions of lives just by being relaxed and more attentive. Um, so this is why relaxation is saving lives. Thank you so much, Ramya. We appreciate you being here. and. Definitely, um, you know, hope we might see you in the Earth Space category next year. That sounds like a really good project. I did have one question for you, Ramya. Um, uh, in terms of testing the memory, I was just curious in, in like how you went about doing that. Yeah, sure. So uh, for our memory test, we had like, um, there were like 10 slides and it was like letters and numbers. So for the first slide, we had like two letters. And then the, they would have to like look at it for two seconds and then write it down so they couldn't see it. And then it would like gradually the number would increase. So it would be four and then it would have to write it down and then six and then it would have to write it down all the way up to 10. So they had to remember those 10 letters. And we did that before and after relaxation. So we calculated their scores. And after relaxation, we found out that they could remember the letters and numbers much more easily. That's awesome. It sounds like a really Thank good you. project. <laughs> Well, good deal. Well, maybe we should open up for questions. Um, uh, if anybody has anything, uh, you could uh, go ahead and raise your, your hand and, uh, you know, by going to the reactions at the bottom and hitting raise hand. Uh, John, you, you sent me um, a question for um, Dr. Kishin. Uh, did you want to go ahead and ask that? Yeah, uh, Kamar, did you, um, did you judge at the International British School of Houston, they had a series of space uh, projects. Was that you about eight years uh, ago? I, I have been there before, but it has been a while. It has been like four yeah. years or something back. Yes, yes, sir. I was there twice. They okay. invited me a couple of times. Right, I think you and I, we, you, uh, we judged uh, one year together. You remember? Yes, you know, I was. Uh, I looked at your face and I said, I have seen you. And now, yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's a series of space projects. Remember that we did like the third grade and the eighth grade and the 11th grade? Yes, sir. I, I remember it like yesterday because that school is, you know, innovative. Uh, I mean, the way they have planned the school itself is an innovation. Uh, I was very impressed with that. I talked about that school several times. Right, yes, we covered, they covered quite a few of your subjects in your presentation. 
uh, they were rudimentary, but uh, uh, they were they were there, huh? Yes, yes. Right, it was Absolutely. a lot of fun. I, uh, I they, enjoyed it. And they were talking about uh, you know creating a uh, little more gravity with certain mechanisms uh, in the spacecraft, and I was very attracted. I don't want to say it because it could be proprietary. It had to do with electromagnetism. So I was impressed. I was honestly impressed. I, I told them that they should go further and perhaps even try to get it patented. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, like I said, I enjoyed it. I thought it was uh, very interesting that would, they would have teachers that would uh, dwell you know, on, on the, that, uh, or, or focus, I should say, focus on it. Yeah, that's all. Well, um, if anybody else has a question, just go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Uh, Dr. Uh, Christian, I, I had a, a question. Uh, in terms of the wavelets, that sounds really fascinating. Uh, do you have any recommendations for a, a good introduction to, to kind of understand it a little bit deeper? Uh, go, go to uh, the uh, website, uh, uh, Rice University website. Uh, Richard Baranuk is still, I believe, there. And he is one of the tops. And uh, if I understand right, uh, you know, some of these high level cameras uh, come with a, the reason why it's called wavelet technology as opposed, we started out calling it wavelet processing, but technology is because now the chips are there that generate these wavelets. Uh, so that's why that name technology. So once you have these chips, what you can do is, you can decompress these photos. So where you, you can store 10,000 photos, now you can store in the same storage, 100,000. And honestly, you wouldn't know the difference. The reason is it throws out uh, data that is not needed in the image. That's the main point. Because the, like Shannon said, there is no information if nothing is changing. Right? Shannon said, there is information only when things are changing. So what this beauty about this wavelets is that if in a photo, there is an area that didn't change is uniform in intensity, well, it'll just make it almost a point as opposed to having thousands of points there. Where it will put stress and importance is the boundaries, like your eye, you know, where suddenly from the forehead, now we see a boundary. So it tracks the boundaries in videos and photos. That's the best way I can explain it. And again, um, Ronnie Wells, head of the Department of Mathematics, uh, Dr. Sidney Barris have been my teachers. Kumar, here's how it works. Here's a presentation for you. Then I take their presentation. I go back to Johnson Space Center. I do my dance, song and dance to get them interested. So far, little bit, not a whole lot on wavelets. But on superconductivity, I got just before I retired in 2018, they funded a project at University of Houston to investigate how we can put this energy where Kumar said years ago, we can we don't have to even need liquid nitrogen, we can put that energy. So there is a project on that. So slowly and steadily we're marching there. They're also, uh, GSE is working on deep learning algorithms quite a lot. And we are also working on now on augmented reality because it's a, uh, I excited them that it's really something uh, that will help astronauts psychologically. That was my big thing, although it has other incredible applications. That is uh, really awesome. Um, anybody else have uh, questions or comments? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Go ahead. I have, a, I have a comment and a question that's possibly for more than one person. Uh, my comment is that, first of all, Dr. Christian, I really enjoy your presentation. There's a lot to gather. Lot, very comprehensive. I appreciate it. Um, 
you know, the wavelet graphic technology reminds me of artificial intelligence neural imaging, which is a feature, a new feature in Adobe Photoshop. Uh, I know it's a mouthful, but if that's something you might want to investigate later. Uh, and the question is, is anyone working on integrating carbon nanotube and wavelet technology into the 3D printing of spacecraft? I think together they would be very powerful. Uh, honestly, not that I know of. Greg might know. We, we, uh, we started, yeah, Greg might know. We started working on 3D printing over here. Yeah. And I'll be honest, in the beginning, it was almost like learning. And then I uh, had uh, uh, two students and they were actually undergraduate students. And uh, I had uh, a concept where I wanted um, a solar panel uh, to automatically, how do I say, orient itself to the, uh, uh, to be perpendicular to the sun's energy on the moon or Mars. Now these two kids, they 3D printed that mechanism that I, in fact, they improved. I had a concept and they improved the concept. And one of them is doing PhD at MIT now. So, uh, uh, so that's, in other words, we started here learn on the learning curve because it didn't come from NASA. They 3D printing, to my knowledge, came from outside. So then uh, how far it has gone, uh, I don't know. At Rice, I believe they are more in the pure work. You know, they, they, the rice is like, you know, they, they do less applied and more pure. So anytime you are talking about now bringing things together to see what the new material will be. Uh, but, but it's a great question. It's a great question. I'm gonna think about it very hard. Well, thank you. I'm impressed that you're making a, uh, a step toward the integration of uh, whatever of the technology that is currently present to make a smart panel. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sm a smart pebble? A smart panel. Uh, oh, smart panel. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, this touch screen and all that, uh, uh, I, I used to be the uh, manager for advanced programs. Uh, and TI, Texas Instruments from Dallas, had a project called Deformable Mirror Device, DMD. Have you heard of that, DMD? I have not. Sounds, uh, okay. it sounds like Deformable a Mirror yeah. Device. Shockingly, they're like 24, if I recall, by 24 array of, uh, you know, um, uh, semiconductor uh, chips behind this deformable mirror. And then they were moving, uh, the, the, mo the mirror was being controlled at each location by the bias of those chips. It was a very simple thing. And I got fascinated. I, uh, I pushed my center here to, to kind of, you know, find them, look where we are now. My kids gave me on Father's Day, Microsoft touch screen, laptop. First time I'm using for the Zoom session, Heather, first time. And it worked nice. much better than my old one. But my point is deformable mirror device. And now this, where, so, so technology has to be, you know, kept on pushing and we'll get there. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. I, also want to open up for people to, uh, since we're coming right here to the end, uh, open it up to uh, anybody who has uh, space related experiences they want to share. And uh, maybe along those lines, uh, it'd be good. Um, uh, you I know, there's three. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to thank you. It was a really, really inspiring presentation. And I was just thinking, uh, I studied masters of uh, uh, architect space architecture at UH, and I was wondering why we didn't invite you over to give us a speech. That these, these are really inspiring, and these are really good for new students. And uh, I'll talk to Dr. Bonova about maybe inviting you for the next semester for the new students, because this, this piece that you gave us, it opens different 
um, black holes that they, each of them they need um, somehow infection and maybe inspires the new students to pick their research area and maybe they can follow up with one of those. That was really good. The 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 beauty beauty about I say beauty uh, I better be careful about University of Houston is that there's a lot of applied uh, engineering going on, a lot of technology development going on. And so you will see that all of these, you know, 31, I selected 31 technologies from a list of like two, 300 technologies. All of these will be needed in space, one way or the other, because everybody, all my colleagues said, Kumar, this is great. We need this, we need that, so on and so forth. But therefore, yeah, if there is a chance to talk. Uh, we are trying, I mean, Six Eyes is trying to find a good source of funding to work more on AR, VR for astronauts. And we have bought some uh, equipment and tools to kind of make a specific lab for this issue. Uh, we haven't started actually working on it. We are still waiting for more equipment, but I don't know, maybe that could be a good collaboration or good start, at least for the new students to move forward with the ideas that you were talking about. I will help you even connecting, you know, but but again, I will be uh, glad to present in detail these 31 technologies. We didn't talk about Sunny White's research at all. You know, the, 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 that concentration of, of particles in space that come from sun and many other sources. What do you do with them? It's an incredible idea. Catch these uh, powerful, you know, they, they're very energetic particles. Catch them. You're seeing what we can do with sunlight. Sunlight is no match for these particles. And then make a rocket out of them. So th there's a lot to talk about. Sorry, I got off on tangent, but if you guys want, you have a person that will talk there until it is dinner time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that is really interesting. We enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, we definitely would like to have some type of uh, a social events that maybe includes dinner. So uh, uh, we could we could uh, actually put that. You could, you could talk uh, uh, at dinner as well. <laughs> uh, but it'd be a fascinating thing to. Uh, uh, get together and uh, to kind of explore these topics uh, some more. Um, I did want to point out that tomorrow is the Virgin Galactic launch. Uh, the coverage starts at 8 a.m. our time, so 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern is 8 a.m. Central. Um, and you just have to go to the Virgin Galactic's uh, website, uh, and you'll be able to uh, uh, see uh, Richard Branson and a few other people um, go to travel to the edge. Uh, of the atmosphere. Uh, there's anybody? Oh, there's go ahead. There's going to be, uh, Nathan, there is going to be a young lady from India on that flight. So she's catching a lot of publicity right there at the extreme. No, not at the extreme. She is on the side of uh, 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 Richard our star. Yeah, our star. On one side, I she didn't know her name. Uh, it's a I, with my age. Uh, there comes that limitation. Uh, but she is uh, uh, born in India, and she came here as an immigrant. She is the second one. The first one was. My friend Kalpana Chawla, unfortunately, you know what happened, Columbia accident, but uh, she's the second one uh, that was born. Now we have Sunita Williams. She uh, was in International Space Station and she's also a good friend of mine uh, for more than six months, but her record was for some time. <laughs> yes, she had a record, but not afterwards. So we'll That's see how it, how it goes. So uh, will you be watching it tomorrow? I'll be watching it on my laptop. New laptop. That, that's awesome. Um, well, and then the other one that's coming up on the, the 20th is actually uh, the um, 
you know, the new Shepherd flight. Um, as uh, Greg mentioned, uh, Wally, uh, Wally Funk's going to be on it, one of the uh, Apollo 13. Um, uh, Wally, uh, Wally what did you say? Uh, Wally Funk. Okay. There was another Wally, but he was not Apollo astronaut. Go ahead. Yes, this is one of the 13 uh, female um, potential astronaut candidates that went through uh, some privately funded testing back during the Mercury uh, program oh, with the okay. idea of, of um, you know, per perhaps being able to fly a woman at that time. And ever since then, all the way up to now, uh, Wally's been uh, really an advocate for space and, and um, aviation and and she's finally getting to, to fly to space with uh, Jeff Bezos. So that's, that's gonna be, uh, be something else. Blue Origin has published a poster comparing side by side which one's Branson company and Blue Origin and they're saying that <laughs> which one's Branson's company is not going to space. That is not the definition of space. So they're lower than the actual height. So they're not considered as space even though we you are going to fly earlier. Yeah, they said Blue Origin, they can avoid the asterisk next to the astronaut coin, the asterisk being only if you count the US government uh, definition of space, not the international one. So you could be an asterisk astronaut on Virgin Galactic. And I read uh, an article, I don't know how credible it was, but there's some um, considerations about actually reducing the international line to 80 uh, kilometers uh, as, as well. So that, that'd be uh, curious. Um, I did see Jeff Bezos in a little Instagram thing to Richard Branson and uh, Virgin Galactic wish them a safe uh, flight tomorrow. So uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of uh, um, glassiness might be returning to, to that dialogue. Uh, the one other thing I, I think I, I mentioned, unless somebody else has something, is uh, last Thursday, as a volunteer at the Space Center uh, Houston, um, they were training the, uh, the tour operators, you know, the host and the tram drivers and all that on how to uh, start doing the Apollo 11 mission control tours. And so they invited uh, Space Center volunteers uh, to sort of uh, come along uh, and uh, I got I got to go. Um, this particular mission control room supported all of these these missions. Um, not listed here is uh, the Apollo One uh, mission as as well. So um, this was the room where they were had the uh, controllers conducting uh, the 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 test flight. You know the tests uh, there. So uh, as well as the the Challenger. I forget which what the designation of the Challenger flight was, but um, it's made a, a fairly significant deal about this room having seen uh, both tragedy and, and triumph. Um, and six, I'll go ahead. 51L. 51L, okay. That would be this one right here. And uh, the experience is amazing. Um, you, you watch a, a short little video and then the room comes alive as if it was July 24th, 1969, uh, whenever Neil and Buzz uh, were actually landing on the moon and all the consoles are displaying uh, what they um, were displaying at that time. The screens at the top are displaying and you're hearing the, um, you know, the, the flight controller loop of all the audio interactions between the flight controller and the rest of the team here in the room, as well as interactions with the astronauts on the ground. And then they kind of move forward to that first step onto the surface of the moon. And then uh, they jump forward a little bit more to the astronauts uh, returning, um, you know, landing out at sea and arriving on the aircraft carrier. Uh, and they've completely recreated this room. Everything is as authentic as they can make it. Uh, there are three sort of um, things that were different between uh, the room now and the, the time of uh, Apollo 11. Uh, the mission plaques um, over here, they have the little mirror in the shadow box 
that Apollo 13 astronauts uh, used to to actually uh, look out um, and see the, the you know the explosion uh, and the debris floating away, um, and then the other uh, really. I mean, they even have like ashtrays here. They they have ashtrays on the back of the seats as well. Uh, so that, that kind of um, uh, makes it, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then over here, they have an American flag that the Apollo 13 astronauts uh, were meant to, to leave on the moon, um, but uh, they weren't uh, able to do that because they couldn't land. Um, but the Apollo 14 astronauts took it to the moon and brought it back. Uh, so that's another thing that was different uh, between the Apollo 11 landing and, and now. Uh, there's also something else peculiar about the design of that flag. Um, anybody uh, know uh, what it is? Uh, just a, a hint, uh, the number of stars. 13, I believe. Uh, 48, uh, Hawaii and Alaska weren't states uh, whenever no one buzz, um, uh, you know, during the Apollo program. Uh, so that, that was kind of interesting to, uh, to reflect on. But uh, it's, it was really quite an experience. Uh, so they have tours, it's included in with the mission. I uh, definitely uh, recommend, uh, you know, they, they went to the, all the families of the flight controllers uh, and uh, were able to get like the notebooks and the things that the flight controllers had on their, their uh, desk, the can, mugs. I'll go ahead. Can, can I make uh, one point? Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you go back on that one slide, uh, could you go back? Yeah, just stop there. Uh, I, I can't tell you, you know, Rolf Sawyer was the head of the communication for the Apollo. He uh, got a fellow of IEEE. Last name was S-A-W-Y-E-R. He was my boss for three, four years. <laughs> Can anybody believe right now when I say this? He said, Kumar, why do we need push button phones? It's going to cost us a lot of money to take these phones. I swear, these are his words. Uh, God bless him. He, he was a great man. You know, obviously, he was in charge of the communication and flawlessly communication work. And what people don't know, digital communication. Thanks to Virginia Tech, top-notch professors, we had a coded 13-bit signal <laughs> that... At that time, I didn't have the security clearance, but I got the sniff of it. But my point is, not to belabor the point, he said, why should we have this push button? I don't understand what we gain. So I, in my own humble way, I explained. That's all I can tell you. It wasn't an easy question. Because you see, you, this is the dilemma people don't understand. Once we get committed to processing signals with cosine transform, then changing all of a sudden the processors in the space station to wavelet transform is not economical. So there's a lot of money in it. So anyway, that's why he was asking. It'll take us a lot of money to take all these phones and then get these push buttons. Now see where we are, right? Look at where we are. Yeah, it'd be uh, interesting to take this phone and uh, show it to somebody in elementary school today and see if they even recognize it as being a phone, number one. But having recognized it as being a phone, try to see if they can actually figure out how to make a phone call on it. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, it's the, the whole idea of having to, to spin around and wait for it to come back. Uh, and and that's a forceful demonstration of power of technology. Uh, I, I was talking earlier, I was on the agency communication and tracking, uh, sorry, communication uh, committee. And when we were talking about these satellites and I wrote in my paper that one day we will have a watch size phone that will be talking. People thought I had lost this. Look where we are now.
Exactly. We have watch size phones that you can use for talking. And, um, you know, playing card size devices that you can use for talking, sending email, doing video conferencing, uh, navigating, it's, it's really, really come along. You know, Nathan, you're much too young. That is a modern phone that you're looking at there. <laughs> when I grew up, and I'm not kidding you, yes. we had a party line crank phone. I had to pick it up, crank it, and say to the operator, would you connect me to so-and-so? So you're you're not looking at old technology there. <laughs> uh, I I I yeah. Barbara, and, and, thank you, thank you. That was a great point. Yes, I recall even those days at Calcutta University they had that kind of situation. You know, though I'll have to say, uh, for for some purposes, analog technologies still have utility, right? And we sometimes forget what they do differently as, as far as controls and such. Yeah, and you know, one thing is uh, today is so easy to call people uh, that you could call them without thinking about it. Uh, there's also that human technology of, of just slowing them down a little bit and saying, do you really want to make that call? You know, <laughs> you kind of. Well, we, we, are, we are analog beings by nature, I believe. Right. Yeah. And uh, let me just see. Oh, you know, you got the TV, um, a modern TV right here. Just, uh, Somewhat modern. And oh, uh, the other thing is uh, messages were sent to pneumatic tubes. Uh, and that's what these are, just like at the bank teller. Uh, that was how they sent messages. Uh, computers at this time were used for computing, uh, not for um, communications. It worked in their time, and it's always nice to have a redundant system in case you need it. Not that I would believe they'd been installed, but you never know. There might be a supplemental system on the side just in case the unexpected happens. I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't have that answer then. Maybe somebody else does. Well, and, and if, if you've seen hidden figures, the, the backup is uh, some smart woman with a pencil is calculating. Um, incidentally, about the cigarettes, um, apparently when they went and took the equipment out of this room, there were, uh, I'm not sure the, the, the scale, but a significant number of cigarettes that had Kind of fallen underneath and around the equipment and when they had um kind of renovated this room um they they actually kept those cigarettes uh here um and you know put them around as as props well you know it was definitely a a symptom of of the era i don't know if any of, of you read isaac asimov but one of the interesting things that I noticed uh, when rereading something just recently is that um, it tens of thousands of years in the, in the future, he still had uh, people smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so, so, so we have made some progress since the 50s. Absolutely. Um, um, just a side note, if, uh, most of the NASA software that was used during the Apollo or even before or after that, they are available free. If you search for NASA software, you can enter that. And for example, you can install uh, Apollo's software that they use to land a uh, lander on your iPhone and you can play with it. And even you can install it on your computer. And I mean, they are open sources. You can even modify them for your purposes for designing a game or something like that. That that is that that sounds like kind of a, a neat uh, project that maybe we could have a workshop on sometime. Uh, there there are hundreds and hundreds of software over there because they were developed during the time that, for example, one of them is monitoring the health, one of them is a, an alarm to wake up the astronauts. There are, if you check the website, there are, I think, five or six different categories, communications, health, monitoring, or there, there are lots of categories. And then you can pick whatever you need, and then it shows that what kind of 
uh, op operation system it is compatible with and then you can download. They were a bit like modern apps, right? And, and then we quickly moved on to stuff that was more integrated. Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I didn't uh, install them all, but I have seen the Apollo's version on the phone that you can really play with it. And uh, I mean, related to the, this one, two years ago when they were celebrating the Apollo's mission and so on, at MIT Museum, they kind of had the whole mock-up of the Apollo's cockpit. So you can really sit there, play with all the keys and uh, joysticks and everything and try to land the Apollo. I mean, I tried a couple of times, but every time it's crashed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a huge it's a very fun thing to do. I I think probably they have more than one of them in the country. So I don't know where they are, but it's a very very fun thing to do. Hey, hey Greg, maybe we should uh, one day give a demo of actually doing these calculations with a slide rule. You <laughs> we're, we're old enough to remember doing that, right? Uh, the, the demonstration of what? Calc doing these calculations with the slide rule instead of a calculator. Oh, yeah. yeah. I might even I, still have one somewhere. I, I do. I, I have one. Uh, I, I can c consider it a collectible, right? Yeah. <laughs> At least in the engineering community. Does anybody I, have an abacus? Uh, only a toy one. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But, but I, I wanted to come back to the flag thing. Uh, ben Husset, uh, thank you so much for uh, the message. Um, uh, he uh, apparently I was given some misinformation on Thursday. Uh, Alaska became a state on January 3rd, 1959, and Hawaii became a state on August 21st, 1959. Um, so in 1969, there were 50 states, and there were. Um, there were. And uh, counting the stars, uh, I mean, uh, Ben recognized that uh, this was not the 48 star configuration. So counting the stars, um, I, there's, there's actually 50 stars there. So that little uh, tidbit that I, I learned last Thursday was actually completely wrong. So I, I, next time I'm at Space Center Houston, I have to keep an ear out for that and make sure it's, it's not, in the, <laughs> not in the script. Um, so yeah, anyway. for sure. I, I think there was a lot of changes going from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo. Uh, certainly one thing I, I noticed uh, is that it became more pilot oriented as they had more and more controls. And that was insisted by the astronauts themselves. Yeah, I can remember talking to Harrison Smith about that and it was, and he's not a pilot, right? But, uh, you know, the, the idea of being the uh, pet monkey locked into this thing was not particularly <laughs> appealing to most astronauts. And then you look at the STS and the pilots actually have, what, 1,000 or 2,000 switches on an STS. So they have tremendous amount of control. And, and then you look at Branson and, and, and th those folks, and they're, they're now going up in automated systems, right? And, and we're just going to hope that the computers don't crash us. I don't know. I think I prefer the, uh, the version that has a couple pilots on board. I, I could be too old fashioned, right? Well, they have, they have a calculated system, the flutter system for Branson's machine. Right. It's it's all calculated based on altitude. Is that right? Um, I guess, uh, uh, John, who are you directing the question to? And could you oh, repeat it? Maybe anybody. Uh, Barbara. I thought Barbara knew the answer. No, I re I really don't know how this automation works. Right. Um. Although, heck, I mean, if we can automate the Mars rovers, we can certainly uh, automate uh, a suborbital flight, right? Um, but I, I guess having spent time around uh, some of the older astronauts, it's like, uh, yeah, I, may, maybe I don't want to be a pilotless guinea pig. You know, I mean, we've, we've seen that with the pilot, the driverless cars, right? Uh, oh, when I they thought... work well, they work well, and and when they fail, <laughs> they fail catastrophically, right? Yes. 
But I thought the accident, you know, the accident going back to 2014 was because the pilot took over and he actuated uh, the flutter too soon. And that's why it crashed. That's well, and, what I understand And we certainly as well. see that with, uh, uh, with uh, air, airplane accidents, right? That, that the pilots tried to overcorrect from a problem with the, with the autopilots. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a really interesting thought, right? I mean, you know, we, we have somebody like Sully who uh, can, can land the thing uh, on, on, on a river uh, based on 50 years of experience of what that thing feels like. But by golly, you could, and, and especially, you know, um, you have time in simulators, but I'm not so sure. I, I would like to know, and if anybody knows, it, it might be interesting to look this up, how much time uh, the, um, the, the new uh, pilots in these actually have in, in simulators, right? Um, and uh, obviously they have zero flight time, right? They're, they're even, you know, if, if you look way back in, into the 50s and test pilots and stuff, uh, they, they, they were spending time in the air, um, and, and had lots of hours and and you get kind of an intuitive feel for how a system works when, when you spend a lot of hours in it. So, so now, uh, you know, I'd love to see the question of uh, what, whether their, their pilots have um, any kind of hours in, in, even in simulated worlds, right? Let alone in the real world, because maybe I'm gonna <laughs> go back and, and say, I agree, I wouldn't let them have the controls either. Well, Sully answered that question. He said he knew the plane and he also knew the Hudson River. So he knew it would be uh, uh, successful, what he did. Yeah, exactly. And, and that comes not from, you know, that, that comes just from, from, from years of brain muscle memory sort of there. And, you know, and it, and it doesn't, and, and simulators do a lot for that, uh, but, uh, you know, no, nobody lets a uh, pilot take a uh, military plane until they've spent hours playing around in the virtual world these days, right? They don't even get behind the controls. So I, I don't know, um, you know, where pilots are nowadays. Certainly commercial pilots well, don't have I, anything like the experience I've seen statistics. I actually have a little bit of insight into that. I was taking uh, flight training over here at uh, David Wayne Hooks Airport uh, near where I live, um, flying in a Cessna 172. And my instructor recently went over to, um, I forget, one of the, the like the subcontracting air, airlines for uh, United. And uh, he was telling me kind of um, most of their lines won't look at you until you have uh, you know, I think like 1500 hours. Um, and then, um, you know, he was saying that, and that's flying like a Cessna 172, you know, maybe some uh, single and double um, uh, propeller uh, type of uh, craft. And then he was gonna go to do um, their pilot training, which included a lot of simulation time. And the first time that he would fly in a plane would be as a co-pilot with uh, passengers in the back. Uh, so they definitely have a lot of flight time and, and um, you know, um, kind of non-jet planes, uh, but uh, they, they sort of build up their, in, in the, for his particular track, they build up their uh, jet plane experience actually on the job. And, and you know, uh, I, well, I'll tell you, all the Cessna pilots I know would say non-jet time is meaningless. I mean, they just, you, you know, uh, propeller planes just don't fly like jet planes. The, the, the oh. physics and, and, and the glide ratios and all that, they're just not anything like uh, apples. They're apples and oranges at best, maybe apples and lettuce. And turning uh, to- oh. Can I make one point, quick point? Uh, one, one of the things I studied was the eyes for the robots. So I was uh, heading for almost like 20 years. How, what do we do in terms of providing the vision uh, to robots? Now, 
one, so a lot of this automation in the cars and many other things um, has tremendous risks and potential for failure because uh, uh, the failure to be able to see what's coming at you, uh, yeah. what you're going through, the traffic, particularly in the case of aircraft. I think one of the big reasons why radar became so uh, such a uh, great instrument is because of the aircraft, you know, so we could see where we are going. In this case, if you've got a rocket flying, there's nothing, hopefully, if there is something they are done, uh, there's nothing, it's all clear. Uh, so the, the eyes don't have to be there, okay? It can be blind, but what has to be there is timing and uh, GNC, guidance, navigation, uh, and communication. Th so those are the things that, uh, that are easier in this case. Now, if some timing goes wrong, that's what, where the problem is uh, that you're stating. If so something goes wrong in the timing, you're done. Well, uh, we're a bit over time. Uh, so um, I think uh, this might be a good place to wrap things up and then uh, look forward to, well, I should mention something. I got a call from the library on um, uh, Friday afternoon saying that there are opening rooms at 20% capacity. And in the room that we're normally in, uh, that would equate to about 22 people. Uh, so kind of looking at possibly having a hybrid meeting uh, in August. So for uh, vaccinated people who feel comfortable uh, socially, socializing with other people in uh, closed spaces uh, might have the opportunity to do so. And we'll uh, still have the online option for people who are not vaccinated or who don't feel comfortable or who simply uh, can't travel uh, to the library. Uh, so, um, uh, so that would be... That would be there. What's the date on that, Nathan? Uh, so it's the first Saturday in August, which is the 7th. The 7th. Yep, first Saturday. And then um, I'll send out from plans once we've kind of uh, tested out and, and see if uh, our speakers for the month can can come and, uh, uh, you know, just to see where we are. But that's that's a possibility. Well, very good. Thank you all again for attending our meeting and for uh, your, your input and interaction. And uh, I hopefully I look forward to seeing you all on the 7th. <laughs> uh, Leonard, thank you. Like and pleasure. Thank you. you Dr. Krishner, thank you so much. It's good to meet you again. <laughs> Same here. Hey, Same we, here. We, we need to team up and do another fair. You yes, sir. Judge? You want to judge again? Yes, yes. I will when you invite. What do you like, Earth and Space Sciences? You want to judge for a, um, um, a summer internship for Space Center Houston? A position? Sure. Okay, uh, I'll see what keep I can me, do. I'll let you know. Keep me informed. Let me know. And uh, Heather has my email address. She can share with you. Okay, good. I'll keep you in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Adeline, it looked like you were saying something, but uh, you're on mute. Uh, so uh, maybe. Hi, I was listening. Um, I just didn't have my camera on the whole time. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you came. I, I glad Me you too. Came. Me too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Have a good well, weekend, everyone. Bye. Yes. Have a good Bye. weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Enjoyed your talk. We'll see you again. Okay. Bye-bye.